Good morning, everyone. I'm Mark Schlotty. I'm the Group Manager for National Connections within AMO. The National Connections team works across all named jurisdictions, fulfilling AMO's advisory function for all new and modified generation connections. I'd like to provide you with an overview of the current connection volumes and trends, together with an overview of some of the challenges faced and opportunities to improve. This presentation will be broken into topics that we'll look at. What the generation mix looks like during the energy transition using data from the latest AMO ISP report. A high level overview of the volume of active connection projects. Look at the changing trends in the projects being developed and what this means. Project considerations when initially planning a project. Information that is available on the AMO website that can be used to help projects select sites. And finally, look at the opportunities and improvements in the connection space. This slide provides an overview of the changing generation mix that has been used in the ISP central scenario. You can see that the high carbon generation retiring will continue to lead to high demand for more renewable generation. Given that we're the left hand side of the graph, you can see that we're only starting out in this journey. When we move to looking at the connections by numbers, it's easy to see the level of opportunities there are for the development of new projects and more importantly, new technologies to meet these projections. This also needs to be considered alongside the high uptake of rooftop PV across the NAM, which is resulting in record new demand levels in Victoria and South Australia. Now, if we look at the NAM connections by numbers, it's obvious that there are a large number of projects that are active in all regions. These numbers cover all stages of the connection process from the inquiry right through to commissioning. These numbers only include transmission inquiries and not distribution, as the key connection data requirements do not currently apply to distribution level. What's really interesting when we look at the total of 70,178 megawatts is that only around 14% of this number is actually from committed projects. By that, we mean they have either agreed performance standard and connection agreements or are actually registered and undergoing commissioning. This shows that there are a lot of projects in the pipeline. There continues to be a high level of new inquiries and applications across the name, even when we consider the technical challenges with approximately 16 to 18 of each category in the past two months. When looking at the changing trends across the name, for new generation connections, I thought it'd be useful to look at the changes to solar generation, wind generation and battery. This information is up to date as of the start of November. The projects that are in the application category are projects that have typically been in the pipeline for a number of years, approximately one to three years. And we can see this has been led by the high volume of projects being currently developed across the name. When we look at the projects, that are in the inquiry stage, you can see that there are a great reduced number of solar projects, but a higher number of wind trip projects, which tend to be coming much larger than the currently commissioned wind generation projects today. And lastly, as many of you will not be surprised, there has been a huge increase in the number of battery projects across the name. This includes new battery projects, but also modifications to existing connections. There have been a number of major changes across the name that has resulted in the challenges we face today. The generation face of the name has considerably changed, where today we have 445 generators participating in the name. Since 2017, the number of renewable projects has greatly in increased, which has resulted in today the name having 52 solar generators and 58 wind generators. These numbers do not include the committed projects that are currently in the pipeline. This increase, together with the major increase in committed inverter connected projects, has added extra complexity that not only makes the connection process more challenging, but also makes the operation of the real time name more complex. There has also been a high level of interest in DER including world-leading take-up of rooftop solar in residential households across the name 
which has created challenges all of its own. With the complexities faced, the following are just some of the aspects that need to be considered as they will have an impact on the challenges faced when going through a connection process with your NSP or AMO for new projects. The location of the projects. An example would be, does it have high or low system strength? The size of the project. Is it suitable for the area of the network at which it's planned? Another one would be technology. Has it been used before? Is it the first time it's been used in Australia? Does it have a pro proven PSCAD model? What sort of issues were faced? It's good to understand these things and also things like the concentration of new projects. Is there a risk from interactions with other projects? Or on the other hand, is it an opportunity to have joint solutions to technical challenges? The other one that finishes off would be the connection risks. Do you have the right consultants? Do you have the right resources? EPC, OEM, it's all down to the selection. There are so many variables but it's important that you consider all the connection risks that you face. To help with some of the challenges with the consideration of projects and location, AMO can publish a number of different resources that can be useful to you. We have the connections maps. This example is for Victoria, where you can see the number of inquiry application and operational plants. So you can look at the network and decide where would be a suitable location. We publish these maps for each region of the name and can be found through the connections part of the AMO website. Another resource that's available on the website is also the AMO interactive maps. In this map you can see where the system strength has been given a score. You can see on the left hand side where the red is the low and the green is the high and you can see the locations. You can also use the predictions going forward as these have been used for the ISP to help identify locations. This is another one of the AMO interactive maps that outlines and shows the resource potential across the name. You can also see whenever you overlay this with the system strength map, as Alex has already talked about, that where there's a good resource, you can see where there's also a low level of system strength. But these, there are a number of resources that are available to help work through information. When looking at improvements, it's important that all stakeholders work closely together as the challenges cannot be solved by one group of stakeholders alone. Some of the areas can be addressed by short-term solutions, but others will require more long-term solutions, an example of which would be regulatory change. Here you can see the four areas that have key issues to resolve, the process, the system, projects themselves, and the regulatory framework. The process is one area that AMO and NSPs have direct control over. In this area, AMO is working to make more information available to, stake, to help stakeholders understand the process by clearly commuting the process and the requirements. To achieve this, AMO is reviewing the content of its website and documentation to, to ensure it provides clear and understandable guidance for new connections. AMO is also working to provide information that will be useful to all stakeholders when considering new projects such as the maps already discussed in the last slides. One important thing that AMO is introducing is the new account management function. This is aimed at providing guidance and assistance to proponents along the whole connection process from first considering a project right through to registration, commissioning and full commercial operation. Hello everyone, my name is Sachin Goyal. I'm part of network planning team Powerlink Queensland. Today, I'm given opportunity to talk about system strength impact assessment. In my presentation today, broadly, I will be covering three main topics. I will be talking about current system strength framework. What are the different obligations of AEMO, NSP, TNSP and generators? And then I will be presenting some example cases. The system strength framework was first introduced in 2017 by AEMC. And basically as part of this framework, different obligations were put on AMO, NSPs and uh, generators. The other point to highlight is in current um, system strength framework, the System strength is referred and measured as fault level, basically, which 
as a whole industry whole, we have learned that uh, system strength is uh, more than just fault level. AIMO's obligation. AIMO has obligation to determine the minimum system strength required for secure operation of power systems. AIMO also has uh, obligation to declare any system strength shortfall if that occurs in any area. NSP obligation. When AIMO declares um, any system strength gap, it is TNSP's responsibility to fill that gap as a system strength service provider. It is um, NSP's responsibility to undertake system strength impact assessment. PIA, which is preliminary impact assessment at the time of the inquiry. And if PIA concludes that FIA is needed, which is full impact assessment, then NSP is required to undertake full impact assessment at the time of the application. NSP must also conclude if particular generator connection has any adverse impact or not. Generator has obligation to do no harm. What it means that when a new generator connects to the network, it must not adversely impact the performance of any existing uh, plant connected to the network. It also has a responsibility to provide uh, system strength mitigation uh, if uh, system strength assessment uh, done by NSP concludes that uh, a new connection is causing adverse system strength impact. This diagram is showing the whole process of uh, system strength impact assessment. As I uh, previously said that uh, uh, connecting NSP has uh, obligation to conduct the preliminary impact assessment which is PIA that is done at the connection inquiry stage and if uh, PIA uh, concludes that FIA is not required then application uh, can progress without doing the full impact assessment. Uh, however, if uh, PIA concludes that either FIA is required or it is inconclusive, then that uh, 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 full impact assessment must be done at the time of the uh, application by connecting NSP. And um, as part of the full impact assessment, NSP uh, must uh, uh, identify whether uh, this uh, new generator is causing any adverse system strength impact or not. If uh, adverse system strength impact are identified due to this new uh, application, then uh, it's a generator's obligation to propose mitigation and NSP will assess whether that mitigation is sufficient uh, to uh, remediate the uh, adverse impact or not uh, and uh, that uh, mitigation measures then becomes the part of the application uh, and the generator performance standard. Preliminary impact assessment which is PIA is a very simple fault level based studies and these are basically used as a rule of thumb whether detailed assessment or full impact assessment is needed or not. And uh, the point that I would want to highlight here, it's not really uncommon for uh, a PIA to be inconclusive, hence needing the full impact assessment. When um, connecting an SP undertake a full impact assessment, there are certain detailed modeling is undertaken by the NSP. And the, some of the requirements for the modeling is that system conditions are set up with the dispatch of uh, synchronous generator, generators that result in minimum fault level defined by AEMO. All the connected and committed uh, inverter-based renewable or inverter-based plant should be considered in this analysis. All the Dynamic reactive plants such as SVCs and STATCOMs must also be considered as part of this analysis. If there are any 
uh, intertrip scheme or special protection scheme that must also be included different loading conditions must be considered um, and uh, the load models any uh, best available load models must be used as part of um, this analysis next i will be presenting an example case of an ibr that went through the fia process what you see here is the map of queensland network Queensland transmission network is about 1700 km long. Green circles are um, representing uh, existing synchronous plants. Red circles uh, represent existing IBRs. And uh, blue uh, circles representing existing SVCs and STATCOMs um, in, 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 in the region. And yellow circle uh, represents IBR under consideration for FIA. For FIA analysis, whole Queensland network and part of New South Wales network with all the connected and committed plants are modeled in EMT domain using PSCAD software. For FIA analysis, it is important to make sure that system performance is satisfactory without a plant under consideration for FIA so that the adverse impact due to the new connection can be identified clearly. These figures show systems response without including the plant under consideration for the FIA. Figures show that uh, system performance is satisfactory without the new IPR. Now, what we see here is the system response after the new plant under consideration was connected to rest of the network. A series of contingencies in the different part of the network were run to assess the impact of the new IBR. What we can see here is that a fault was applied and when fault is removed, system does recover from the fault. However, sustained oscillations in the voltage at the connection point, active power and reactive power are observed. What we observed that these oscillations can travel more than 700 kilometers and can be observed in different reasons. What this concludes that uh, this new IBR introduced some interactions and caused undamped sustained oscillations in the network. And therefore, plant is not able to meet its performance standard and results in adverse impact. Therefore, in this case, generator is responsible for the mitigation of the adverse system strength impact that it caused. Once generator proposes the system strength remediation, simulations are rerun and plant's performance is reassessed with the proposed remediation. What we see here is that after the fault recovery, oscillations are well damped and no sustained oscillations that were previously observed um, are there. This proves that remediation proposed by the generator was able to mitigate the adverse system strength impact. At this stage, the proposed remediation becomes part of the generator performance standard or GPS and application to connect progresses. And this brings my presentation to end. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending this workshop. It is a great opportunity to get together and discuss the present challenges we are facing due to high penetration of inverter-based generation in big network areas. My name is Praboda Paranavitana from Main Sister Planning team of Transcript. In general, most of us understand system strength issues are as a power system stability issue. In this presentation, we will emphasize system strength issues are not only a stability issue, but also present significant challenges in the area of power quality. In this presentation, we will discuss two specific topics related to power quality. Challenging experiences in managing harmonic voltages in big network areas, control system interaction and voltage flicker. I would like to note that there are more other aspects worth the discussion 
and we will do so in another future forum. We generally understand weak networks are inherently characterized by high network impedance. It holds true for harmonic impedances as well. Harmonic impedances are high at weak network locations. You can see a comparison of fifth harmonic impedance at a weak and strong network location. The graph shows fifth harmonic impedance as a polygon in per unit. You can see that the impedance at the strong transmission bus is a fraction of the impedance at the weak transmission bus. So, when the harmonic impedance is high, relatively low harmonic current emission can generate high harmonic voltage. An example is given here. As you can see, 1 ampere of fifth harmonic current can generate 0.61% fifth harmonic voltage at the weak transmission bus whereas it is only 0.08% at the strong transmission bus. For comparison, emission limit for fifth harmonic voltage for a 100 megawatt plant is given in column 5. This clearly demonstrates the challenges that a generator to be connected at a weak transmission location will face in complying with power quality technical requirements. Further, high harmonic impedance can cause amplification of remote harmonic voltages. These are measured fifth harmonic voltages over a week at the weak and strong network location we looked at in the earlier slide. It can be clearly seen here that the harmonic voltage at the weak transmission bus is significantly higher than the other. These measurements at the weak location demonstrate two key aspects. First, these harmonic voltages are resulted due to amplification of remote harmonic voltages, not due to any harmonic source being connected at this location. Second, the level of fluctuations in the harmonic voltage at this location indicate the sensitivity of harmonic impedance at this location to various events occurring in the network such as switching in and out of shunt reactive plant. Here is an example uh, where harmonic current injected at the weak location generate very high harmonic voltage levels. In this example approximately 10 to 14 amperes of fifth harmonic current is drawn by the inverted transform excitation currents and this current generates a significant amount of harmonic voltage due to the high harmonic impedance of the location. Once again, this fluctuation in these measurements further demonstrate the sensitivity of harmonic impedance at this location to network events similar to what we saw in the previous slide. To give you a context of the degree of challenge we had, had in this example, the harmonic voltage emission limit for this plant is only 0.33% for fifth harmonic, whereas we note up to 6 to 7% fifth harmonic being generated by the plant. This is the same information we saw in the previous slide, that is, fifth harmonic voltage just generated due to inverted transform excitation current at the weak location. The x-axis is zoomed in to clearly demonstrate how harmonic voltage is increased by further weakening the network. You can see here harmonic voltage is shooted up to 10 to 11 percent when one line connected to the weak location is opened. When the line is open, the harmonic impedance is further increased, causing an increase in harmonic voltage. So how we have managed this challenge? Implementation of several, several things including replacement of all hundred of number of inverted transformers with an improved winding design to reduce excitation current. Installation of 45 megawatt of harmonic filters and also identified the need for harmonic filters to remain in 
service at night requiring cube at night functionality to be enabled. With all these, uh, solar palm effectively act as a fifth harmonic filter and control background fifth harmonic voltage levels. Now we are moving into the next topic. We have evidence control system interactions particularly in weak network areas where a large number of inverter based generation is connected. Southwest New South Wales and Northwest Victoria interconnected network region is a good example. This network area is inherently weak and has more than 3000 megawatt of inverter based generation presently connected. We have evidence sustained small sinusoidal oscillations operationally in this network region. An example is given here. This is a recording from a network event where a line in the network was stripped. Recording shows sinusoidal small oscillations before and after the event. These oscillations are at 19 to 20 Hz modulation frequency, seem to be intermittent, and the magnitude of these oscillations as seen at New South Wales site are 0.4% voltage peak to peak before the event and 0.8% voltage peak to peak after the event. So we all have a question, are these acceptable? So we looked at the impact of these small oscillations. These os oscillations produce flicker. This is an example of recorded flicker levels from an event that caused 5% voltage peak to peak oscillation at 7.3 Hz modulation frequency. This event had lasted for 3 hours and recorded a maximum PSD value of 16.5 that is well above the planning and compatibility levels. So we concluded that small sustained oscillations like these are not acceptable and need the criteria to determine the allowable oscillation magnitudes. So the approach is to limit oscillation magnitudes based on flicker level it produces. As identified in Australian Standard 61415, flicker produced by a given oscillation magnitude depends on the modulation frequency. As shown in the graph, oscillation magnitude of 0.26% at 8 Hz modulation frequency produces perceptibility of 1 whereas the oscillation magnitude at 20 Hz modulation frequency is to be three times larger to produce perceptibility of 1. So our approach is to determine a limit for oscillation magnitude based on its impact on PLT, the long term flicker index. The considerations are uh, the PLT planning level, background flicker levels produced by other sources, use of cubic summation law. Then we have established allowable oscillation magnitudes from control system interactions for a specific location as given in the table here as an example. You can see that these levels are quite small and depend on the modulation frequency. We can compare the allowable levels we have identified with the levels caused by the two events we briefly discussed earlier. Clearly, the event had caused more than the allowable level, alarming the need for careful attention to this issue. Considering the time available, I would end my presentation here. As I mentioned earlier, there are more important topics that we could discuss in a future forum. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, this presentation is intended to cover some of the broad challenges of system strength on the distribution network. Um, it's not intended to represent issues across all DNSPs, rather it kind of encapsulates some of the key challenges we see at Energy Queensland and broadly across our renewable connections. So this slide highlights the significant uptakes of connections we are seeing on the Energy Queensland network. So we're also seeing significant uptakes in other DNSPs um, across Australia as well, um, which presents a significant challenge um, because we're not historically geared to manage these types of connections. 
So we have about 1.8 gigawatts of constructed and committed connections across 31 sites. Um, and some of these sites are very much fringe of grid areas, as you can see on the map. So we have about 1.5 gigawatts of proposed capacity. And those are connections uh, which are in a, a detailed inquiry stage or an application stage. Um, that number would be much higher if we also included um, all those in the preliminary inquiries as well. So what's interesting to note is, I guess, the sheer size of some of these connections. So the largest connection we have is 103 megawatts of solar, um, which is around Toowoomba. And the largest inquiry is 180 megawatts of wind. So some of these connections are actually what you'd expect to find um, on, on a transmission network, um, which presents significant challenges for us. So as I mentioned before, uh, one of the biggest issues we have is the large uptakes of connections um, on the distribution and subtransmission network. Um, but we're also seeing other challenges as well, um, such as the impacts of the weak networks um, and in particular the connection issues associated with um, low short circuit ratio networks. Uh, we're also seeing um, issues around the modeling aspects. Um, of obviously, um, the progression of modeling has moved towards PSCAD and EMT level uh, model requirements, which has placed a lot more um, requirements around what we need in terms of the assessment process. We're also seeing issues around these sort of evolving guidelines. Um, so as we are, I guess, under, better understanding our networks um, and the limitations of these type of asynchronous connections, um, the guidelines are changing um, as required, um, which does um, place more uncertainty around um, the connections and how we assess them. And also just the sheer complexity of some of these connections. Um, we are seeing connections which are basically a mix of different technologies, um, such as wind, solar, BES, STATCOM and SYNCON, um, and trying to manage connections which consist of these hybrid um, technologies um, is, is very difficult. So historically, the term system strength and stability are often associated with the transmission network. And we see that through our connections experiences, where it's often assumed that the connection to a distribution network uh, is less onerous than the transmission. Um, in many cases, um, this is not true. And the experiences with the TNSP connections does not always translate to experiences with the DNSP connections. We find that system strength and stability are often used as a catch-all term for the broad issues, but the issues are often complex and far-reaching. So if we look at the map of Queensland and the existing fault level nodes, you can see that it's very much concentrated to the coast. Um, if I overlay our sub-transmission network in red and the distribution network in blue, you can see that our network emanates far beyond the locations of the fault nodes, as you would expect. Um, and the next overlay shows the location of the existing um, connections. While most of those connections are concentrated to the east of the dividing range, there are many more in those regional areas to the west. Now, if we look at the physical distances between synchronous generators um, to the top of the network, and that's close to 1300 kilometers, then recent studies have found that you know, system strength naturally dis diminishes with electrical distance from the synchronous generators. So often it can be very difficult to ascertain the extent of the network impacts when it comes to system strength and stability. And that's regardless of whether it's on the transmission or the distribution network. So if I can summarize some of the typical distribution network challenges when it comes to these connections. Well, first and foremost, a lot of our network is long radial. Uh, they're inherently weak networks. Um, and we can see that um, basically the Ergon network uh, has one of the lowest proportion of um, customers um, in the NEM network area. Um, because of that, we see inherently large distances between generation and our load centers. Um, and things like the metering comms infrastructure um, is also a big challenge just due to the sheer distances and the cost for reliable comms. So in many cases, a lot of the connections um, We've gone about installing a lot of power quality meters um, and comms infrastructure to try and get ahead of the game. And like many DNSPs, we are you know, managing an aging distribution network you know, in areas that are really prone to cyclones and things like bushfires as well. So that in itself is a big challenge, let alone the, the challenges for renewable connections on top of that again. 
So in the recent um, AMC final report on system strength framework, um, it kind of identified system strength is not an issue on the LV distribution network by virtue of the connection back onto the HV, a much more stable source. However, despite this, um, there has been significant growth in residential solar PV over the last decade, as we all know. Um, and we find that over the last 10 years, um, we've gone up to um, over 2.2 gigawatts of um, grid connected residential solar, um, less than 30 kilowatts. So while the critical focus should really be on large connections and system wide security, our concern is that the subtle and underlying growth of small and medium inverter based generation uh, will present issues into the future. Now, I believe the understanding is still immature on the direct or indirect impacts of on system strength and stability, particularly as the numbers of residential and sub five megawatt connections grow. Um, and whether or not fault levels are sufficient is just one aspect, because we need to consider how they are controlled. Um, things like volt var, volt watt, um, ACE4777, the response to disturbances, DR orchestration across millions of inverters around Australia um, may or may not present challenges to system strength and stability. So we need to be clear on what the DNSP system strength obligations are. So in line with the system strength impact assessment guidelines and the system strength framework, system strength maintenance is a TNSP function. And under the SSIAG, our function um, is really to work with and advise applicants on aspects such as minimum fault levels, preliminary assessments, and undertaking system strength impact assessments. So this means it is very important for DNSPs to work closely with the relevant TNSPs and AEMO to ensure appropriate information in, and, and um, results are shared to properly assess system strength impacts and develop a path forward for proponents. But while there are clear, clear segregation of roles, the difficulty is around the system strength assessments because there is no clear electrical physical boundaries for system strength. And that's why consultation between the NSPs and AEMO is critical to ensure there is an efficient connection process. So in the previous slide, I mentioned that TNSP connection experience does not automatically translate to DNSP connection experience, just due to the inherent differences in our networks. So this slide um, compares our EQL experiences with the multitude of proponents of varying skill sets and experiences. So basically what's good or bad so that future proponents can avoid some of the common fit pitfalls that we see. So an experienced proponent uh, would consider the commercial risk. Now have lower sensitivity to marginal loss factors, export volatility, and look at realistic timeframes for connection. Um, things like siting decisions, um, we'll take into account you know, possible system strength issues um, and ease of connection access, as well as having effective community consultation. Um, things like technical deci decisions will be focused on you know, bringing together the experiences of OEMs and consultants with a known track record. And I think above all, the most important aspect um, is early engagement with AEMO and the relevant NSP so as to um, identify genuine risks um, uh, and difficulties early in the piece um, so that you know that can be considered in the business case by proponents. So I want to quickly cover a case study um, of a solar farm in a remote area in Queensland. So uh, this solar farm um, is connected in a low system strength area. Uh, is connected on a long radial single circuit line 270 kilometers from a bulk supply point. So with a short circuit ratio of less than two. So these, this was one of the original connections that we did. Um, and for that particular area, there have been known harmonic resonances on this network you know, for decades. Um, and that's been appropriately managed by our, you know, by our processes. However, it's not until we performed you know, detailed studies, we were able to determine the real risk um, to the system of having a solar farm connected. And that's important to highlight because the connection process um, we see is an iterative process and it's really there to sort of uncover the potential issues that is relevant to the connection. And sometimes those issues are not obvious. So in that, in our case, we required point of wave switching um, due to transformer energization risks. 
And luckily we did, because attempting to energize the transformer with that point of wave, you know, it led to you know, 1.4 per unit of over voltages on the 132 kV feeder, which basically caused you know, multiple um, trips on multiple occasions. So what are DNSPs generally doing? So the most important thing is the continued investment in capability in our people and our tools. So historically, DNSPs are not geared to cater for connections, whether they're inverter-based connections um, or synchronous connections. They weren't typically in the bread and butter um, things that we did. So it's critical that we invest in people's experience and skill sets across the spectrum, um, from planning, um, impact assessments, um, and commissioning. So this includes um, having the appropriate tools, such as the simulation hardware, for instance, to conduct full impact assessments more efficiently. So we also need to streamline our connection processes to do things better and faster. We also need uh, continued collaboration with the industry. And that means with the relevant TNSP, with AEMO, um, with um, AEMC in terms of things like the rules changes, and um, of course, dealing with proponents. Um, we also need continued investigation into the emerging technologies and solutions. I know at Energy Queensland, a lot of this is focused um, in our distribution network, uh, in managing you know, the large number of um, renewable connections that we have, big and small. And I think as a DNSP, our goal is really to provide high quality advice um, that is trusted and that is in the best interest of all customers, proponents and the network. And by all customers, I mean for Energy Queensland, the 2.2 million customers in Queensland. Um, so it's not just about connecting proponents, but it's about making the appropriate decisions that benefits all users of the network. Uh, and that definitely is a challenge. So thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Hyo Nguyen. I am a Principal Network Analysis Engineer from City Power and Power Core Networks. My main responsibility is to assess new generator and measure augmentation in our network. So today, I would like to talk about the system strength challenges and solution in City Power and Power Core Network. In the last five years, we have received a significant number of new inquiries to connect large-scale generators to our network, and most of them are for inverter-based generators, such as wind, solar, and battery. We have managed to connect more than 800 megawatt of new generator between 2017 and 2019. As you can see in the graph, the number of new inquiries and the volume of new inquiries have been trending down and it is due to several reasons. One of them is the increasing level of complexity and the time taken to assess a new generator connection, especially considering the impact of those new connections on system strength. So here is one example of the challenges that we are facing. Among the five solar farms which have been impacted by the West Murray system strength issue. Four of them are in power core network. They were all connected before the introduction of the system strength framework and before the detailed modeling in PSCAT were available. So since late 2019, power core has been working closely with the AEMO, Transcript, the Phi Solar Farm and the inverter manufacturer to analyze the issue identify a solution and implemented it. There are several lessons that we can learn from this to make sure that we can better handle the situation in the future. The first one is the importance of building trust through transparency between all relevant parties. The second one is a close and strong collaboration between AEMO, NSPs, generators, and OEMs as a key to any success. And last but not least, using a pragmatic approach and enabling flexibility where possible will have a 
to better navigate through the increasing level of, com of complexity and the involving rules and guidelines. Now, I would like to talk about another challenges that we have been dealing with in our network. Since 2017, we have seen an increasing level of interest to connect small-scale or has been connected larger than 1 megawatt and smaller than 5 megawatt generator in our network. Nearly all of those sub-5 megawatt generation inquiries has been for solar PV, so inverter by generator. And as you can see in the graph, the volume has doubled year by year, almost. We have seen some proponents making multiple inquiries. For example, one proponent has made 49 inquiries to date on over the power core network. We believe this is an emerging system strength related issue because if you can see at the volume number here, it is equivalent to several large scale inverter based generators. So the impact of those new generators need to be properly assessed and managed in order to ensure system security. So to do it, we have introduced a set of technical performance standards and modeling requirements with new sub-5 megawatt generators we need to comply with based on the NER, in particular Schedule 5.2.5, the Victoria Electricity Distribution Code, and City Power Power Cooperation requirements. We want to make sure that we can understand the expected performance from those small-scale generators and its impact on system operation, system security, and system strength. We have also updated our connection and generator commissioning guidelines to reflect the new technical requirements. We have also been engaging with generator customer proponents to explain the new requirements and how it will be implemented. Lastly, we have been developing a suit of power system models. We have been improving the system study capabilities, SLS, our internal guidelines and processes to better handle new connection. Hi, and firstly, thanks very much to AEMO and Seagari Australia for inviting me to talk at this uh, System Strength online seminar. Uh, my name's Trevor Lim from Total Loren. I'm the engineering manager there. And today I'll be uh, giving a brief presentation on a generator's perspective on the System Strength framework. Okay, so just a brief overview of what I'll be talking about today. I'll start off introducing Total Loren and Kyamal Solar Farm. Then I'll talk about the concurrent evolution of uh, Kyamal and the system strength framework. I'll give my perspective on the system strength framework and then finish off with some site photos and also a little uh, visualization related to system strength. Just starting with a very brief introduction of Total Ren. We're a global IPP with our headquarters in France. And our first project in Australia is the Kayamal Solar Farm. So the Kayamal Solar Farm, it's located along the Red Cliffs to Marawara to Horsham line in Northwest Victoria. It's located about 100 kilometers south of Mildura. So it's a 200 megawatt solar farm with Ingeteam inverters. And what uh, makes this project uh, quite unique is the large Siemens uh, 190 MVA synchronous condenser. Now I thought I'd just share this timeline of Kyamal and this development of the system strength um, framework just to illustrate the, uh, I guess, concurrent evolution of the uh, uh, two processes. So 
just following it through, starting in quarter three, 2017, the AMC published the Managing Power Systems uh, Fault Level Rule. Quarter four, 2017, the Interim System Strength Impact Assessment guides, Guidelines were published and Comal Solar Farm lodged its connection application with AMO. Now going back to uh, quarter three, 2018, uh, the final system strength impact assessment guidelines were published and Kiama Solar Farm received its 534A and 534B letters. Connection agreement signed quarter three, 2019 and finally registration achieved recently in quarter three, 2020. So now I'd just like to go into a bit more detail about the development of the SYNCON. So it almost goes without saying that the initial solar farm design did not include the synchronous condenser. Uh, its inclusion necessitated a redesign of the solar farm main transformers to limit the 33 kV fault level and a redesign of the Carmel terminal station circuit breaker arrangement. But what were the other options? There was one, uh, don't build the solar farm. Uh, grid forming inverters were not a proven solution. And finally, uh, wait for the outcome of the full impact assessment. With this, there was a still a high likelihood for the need uh, for a SYNCON, um, but there was a lot of uncertainty around the time this would take and also the uh, PSCAD wider area model needed to perform the studies was incomplete at the time. So the agreed approach was a system strength remediation scheme being the SYNCON was agreed with AMO without the full impact assessment. And conservative assumptions were made to size the SYNCON to make the connection point short circuit ratio greater than three which resulted in a large unit with excess capacity, uh, but a high amount of confidence that the solar farm would operate stably. So now to give my perspective on the system strength framework. I think it's clear from the previous slides that Kaimal was in a bit of a unique position in terms of the evolution of the system strength framework. Now it's fair to say, as the power system changes, you can expect um, processes to change as well. But when they do, I think technical leadership and guidance from AMO and the TNSPs is paramount. Uh, generators should be provided with justification and, and clarity when there are process changes and also considerations for, should be given to those who are caught in the middle of uh, changing processes. Now stepping back to the energy transition. I think it's clear to the industry that a lot of grid scale renewables are going to be built. According to the ISP, that's at least 26 gigawatts uh, by 2040 in most scenarios, which means uh, practically that's going to be a lot of system strength remediation because uh, wind and solar is located in uh, the good resource locations are, are located in areas uh, that have lowish system strength today. Now, I find that the issue at present with the system strength framework is that it's a little skewed. Um, we just pause and think, if you have a system that doesn't have much fat, as, as I think it's clear that the system doesn't uh, and every time you bring on new generation um, if that generation is going to cause an adverse system strength impact then it's going to be the generator who has to pay um, and install that remediation rather than the NSP but with a system that doesn't have much fat um, it's it's skewed such that the generator is going to be in that position um, and the, w without the ability for the NSP to consider anything other than generation which is already committed then then the NSP can't really be proactive and, and build out um, 
build out the system. So that's why I, I really welcome the AMC's review, which is focusing on that, allowing AEMO and the NSPs to be more proactive to, to build a stronger system to accept renewables. Um, but I think the, this framework and, and all frameworks um, in the, in the energy industry should, shouldn't just uh, consider cost and system security, they should consider all the fundamentals of the energy trilemma. So I think uh, environmental sustainability or emissions uh, should be given appropriate weighting in terms of um, uh, framework development. So I'd like to just revisit the timeline again and talk about the AMO system strength tender that was run this year. So at the end of last year, AMO declared the fault level shortfall at Redcliffs and using the excess capacity from the Kaimal Sincon, uh, we offered um, that service to AMO. And fortunately, we were winners of the contract, which is great. Um, allowing us to recoup some of the large capital costs of the Syncon, but it also makes it a little bit tricky to understand um, in terms of lessons learned, um, would we do the same thing again uh, in hindsight in terms of essentially overbuilding a Syncon? Something to think about. Now I thought I might just jump to something a little bit different. Uh, Here's some operational data from the Syncon. And I'd like to just demonstrate, even though the, uh, the rules define system strength in terms of fault level, uh, here we can see an attribute of a stronger system, and that's improved voltage on balance. So if you just follow along, here's where the Syncon is uh, turned off. And here's approximately where it's turned on again. So now we direct our attention to the bottom graph and look at the line-to-line uh, -line voltages. So during the time when the Syncon is on, you can see the um, approximate distance between the uh, phases. And then when the Syncon is off, and then when it's on again. So I thought it's a bit of a neat visualization um, of the attributes of an attribute of a stronger system. And now just to finish on, uh, I thought it'd be nice to show some uh, photos of the Syncon as well. So here's the Syncon arriving into Oyen. Uh, some photos of it uh, being installed and, and uh, built or assembled. And then the final product, this photo from inside the yard. And let's not forget that we were here to build a solar farm. Okay, that's all from me. Thanks very much for your time. Greetings all, this is Tony Morton from Lloyd's Register giving a brief consultant's view on system strength issues and how they relate to uh, grid connections and the energy transition in the Australian NEM. I'll just take a couple of minutes first on a brief reminder of uh, the difference between producing energy in a standalone fashion and when connected to a grid, because this is uh, fundamentally what system strength is about. So in a standalone system, one has essentially one generator or a small number of generators. Traditionally, they'd be machines supplying a single load. And those generators have complete control over the uh, fundamental parameters of the system. The frequency and the voltage are directly controlled by those uh, single or small number of machines. And the fundamental control problem is then just to ensure that the generated energy matches the energy demanded by the load from second to second. And this is generally ensured by the frequency and voltage control that the machines exert on this standalone basis. 
this is fundamentally different in a grid connected mode of operation because now the uh, the generator does not have complete control over frequency and voltage at its terminals. Um, these must be now coordinated with all the other plants in the system and the other plants exert these influences over a distributed network that can impose physical constraints on the uh, on, on, on the operation of any plant and on the power flows that can occur in the network. Um, meanwhile, of course, it's no longer necessary for a single generator to exactly balance its local load. Nonetheless, um, the, uh, the overall control of the system, as we know, needs to uh, ensure that the total load is followed in aggregate by the total generation. So system strength issues arise here um, because, uh, because of different locations for the generators and different levels of sensitivity due to the characteristics of the network of uh, local voltages, of phase angles and so on to changes in power flow that occur from second to second in this network. So this brings us to the yin and the yang of power system operation, two complementary principles, which here I'll call stiffness and pliability. When we talk about system strength, we are in essence talking about stiffness, which is the tendency of any equipment in a power system to automatically resist an attempt to impose a change from the wider network. In AC systems, we have two degrees of freedom, magnitudes and phase angles, and so it makes sense to talk about voltage magnitude stiffness, but also angle stiffness. Voltage stiffness or magnitude stiffness is really what we measure with fault level and short circuit ratio. In simple terms, it's really about how similar or different voltage magnitudes are between nearby points in a power system and how much this difference is sensitive to changes in the power flow. Um, angle stiffness is the, um, the equivalent uh, tendency of a voltage at phase angles to move. And in synchronous machines, angle stiffness is actually assured by physically coupling the uh, angle of the internal EMF or voltage to the position of the rotor. And this is quite important because the um, difference in phase angles is actually closely related in power systems to the, um, the real power flow or energy flow between two points. So it's quite an important concept. Now, the complementary concept of stiffness is pliability, which is really just the tendency of um, equipment to follow changes imposed from the wider network. Now, the important thing here is that all equipment in grid connected systems needs a degree of pliability because it's always necessary at some point, sometimes to move an entire power system from one operating point to another. And in order for that to happen, every piece of equipment in that power system needs to be able to um, follow that change to some extent. So it's a delicate balancing act between these two principles. It's useful to look at the interplay between stiffness and pliability concepts with the transition to renewable energy and the fundamental technology change this represents from um, historically synchronous machines to uh, equipment that tends to operate on electronic principles such as in inverters. While these new technologies were only a small proportion of the total generation in the system, when we're talking about 20 years ago, for example, the system operators at the time uh, found it useful to emphasize pliability. And the reason for that was there was well understood behavior from the synchronous machines in the system, which were still doing the heavy lifting. And really the new technology should, um, for proper operation of the network, just follow what the synchronous machines were doing. So pliability ensured that they would um, just follow those changes. Um, but as um, renewable energy penetrations have increased so that they are now displacing uh, synchronous generators to a much larger extent, of course, there is a need for a greater emphasis on stiffness. At the same time, though, uh, we need to recall that a degree of pliability is essential. And so the performance standards we impose on those need to um, allow a degree of flexibility. When we look at fault current, for example, um, we need to re recall that synchronous machine fault current actually is fixed by Ohm's law. Um, it's not a fixed amount um, set by the machine and it depends on the passive characteristics of the faulted network. Uh, when we try and replicate that in inverters, we need to ensure there's a degree of flexibility so that while there's a certain amount of fault current being produced, contributing to the stiffness of the network, that is not so great that it actually destabilizes the network as in fact it can do. 
So I'll talk a bit more now about um, uh, inverters specifically and uh, how they um, in interact with these concepts of system strength. An inverter is essentially just an electronically controllable source of AC voltage at fundamental frequency. And these can be controlled in a number of ways. What's called the grid following configuration is by far the most common um, and, uh, and widely used. It um, works on the principle that an external grid is present and it should simply follow the voltage in that external grid when determining the appropriate current and the appropriate power to inject into the system. Um, of course, the, uh, the, the requirements on these inverters also um, emphasize the need to provide stiffness to support the network under extreme operating conditions such as faults. And in that case, grid following inverters um, need to be programmed to inject a certain amount of fault current. But that amount um, needs to be determined very carefully because, as mentioned earlier, it's a very delicate balancing act between um, providing the required stiffness and not destabilising the network. The alternative grid forming configuration has been discussed by others and uh, does more to, uh, to mimic the voltage source behaviour of a machine. And in that case, the fault behaviour is, is closer to that Ohm's law behaviour that adapts to the characteristics of the faulted network. I'll mention now by way of a case study, a grid following inverter example in the, uh, actually it was the West Murray region uh, where, uh, as is well known, uh, we, we had issues with uh, the weakness of the, uh, of, of the local grid. Um, and uh, we looked at this um, as a, uh, essentially a control tuning problem. And a tool that we used here was um, a mode of control um, offered by the OEM, uh, which gives you um, V as a function of Q um, with a variable droop slope. Um, and by, uh, by, by adjusting this slope, it, it effectively gives you a, a trade-off between uh, what might be considered a more stiff response, where there's a very aggressive Q response to a small change in voltage to a, a more pliable response where the changes in Q are more gentle. Um, and by, uh, by, by tuning this, we were able in the West Murray context to, uh, to, to achieve damping of, um, of the oscillatory behaviour that was being observed. We were able to counteract wind up of the uh, PI controller and we were able to speed up the response to voltage disturbances, um, which gives us a, uh, an improvement in performance as seen on the next slide. As uh, this diagram shows, um, we, uh, we, we were able by tuning that Q of V control mode to, uh, to achieve substantial damping in what was a quite oscillatory response. If we look at the orange trace in this diagram, uh, we had a, uh, a, a response to a large disturbance um, that was relatively underdamped. And by retuning the slope parameter of that QV control, we achieved the response in the blue trace, which was substantially more damped. So in this case, an issue that did arise from a weak grid and from a relatively low system strength environment, which in this case just meant a higher sensitivity of local voltage to power flow, um, was managed through control system tuning. So in summary, the challenge that we face in regard to system strength with grid connections is to align the, uh, the system strength that the plant can offer um, and that the system acquires with, um, with the value proposition for, uh, for, for stakeholders in the commercial and regulatory environment of our national market. And at, at high level, we have um, the, the three technical approaches um, to, to system strength currently, one based on synchronous condensers, the, the drop-in equipment solution, um, which uh, provides that additional stiffness by way of a traditional synchronous machine solution. Um, at a, at a certain cost, which uh, may also add to O&M requirements and adding an additional rotor angle stability node into the system where the, the wider area implications of that need to be considered by the system operator. We have the grid forming inverter technology, which um, can replicate that stiffness contribution through an electronic source. Um, we, we have a demonstration of that in the NEM currently um, in South Australia with the ESCRI project. The, uh, the consideration there, of course, is this is currently um, a mature technology mainly for battery applications um, and uh, currently uh, would need a wind or solar installation to operate as a hybrid with a battery to take advantage of that technology. 
until that evolves further to, uh, to, to be applicable to wind and solar alone. Um, and then there is, um, as, as we just pointed out, the solution based on control system tuning and, and, and getting as much as possible out of the existing technology and existing control systems, possibly with, uh, with, with tuning and with, um, and, and with other uh, control measures, which provide a no regrets measure really, um, and can be considered prior to adding any additional equipment. It's not a panacea, but uh, uh, it, it, it does offer a way to extend performance on a least cost basis for, uh, for, for producers of wind and solar energy. And that's the end of my presentation. I'm happy to take questions later. Hello and good day everyone. My name is Daniel Brem. On my slides, I'm going to give you an idea on the inverters manufacturer's perspective on the topic system strengths. On my very first slide, I would like to show you the map of Australia, which shows all the SMA equipped utility scale projects, which are connected so far. So this is in total, we're talking about almost 100 utility scale projects, which use SMA technology. And in total, this is up to roughly three gigawatts of total installation so far. And there is another one gigawatt, which is already ordered and will be connected pretty soon. And what's so unique about the Australian market, I think everybody here knows that, that one of the main aspects is that typically those projects are connected to a network which provides only a low short circuit level. Uh, the most commonly used term is actually short circuit ratio. So short circuit ratio gives you an idea on the size of the generator installed at a certain point of interconnection in the network in comparison to the short circuit power the network does provide. And therefore there were actually two main things I would like to highlight on this slide. The very first one is that the short circuit ratio at inverter level is typically well below the short circuit level, which is actually given at the point of interconnection. So from an inverter manufacturer's perspective, again, we are even talking about way lower short circuit ratio than what is typically discussed when speaking to the NSPs or IMO. Uh, another aspect which is quite important to understand that if in a network several generators are connected in parallel, even those generators are sharing the existing system strengths or the existing short circuit level at this point. So this gives you a good idea that with an increasing number of generators, asynchronous generators, which are getting connected to the network, the overall short circuit ratio keeps further decreasing. And this is even getting accelerated by the retirement of existing synchronous generators over time. So short circuit ratio is actually not a fixed number, which is given during the installation process of a system, but can typically change a lot during the lifetime of a generator. And this can be something that changes on a daily basis, for example, due to line faults or outages. But it also does change continuously, as I just mentioned, due to the additional installation or retirement of existing generators. So when talking about low SCR, it is quite important to understand that SCR is not giving you a complete picture on what one can expect. It's just a good indicator on how challenging it may become to find a good tuning of the overall generator. Um, one of the most critical points typically is the synchronization of an asynchronous generator to the existing network. Uh, and just to give you here an idea on the right hand side, you can see the inverter internal frequency, which is the result or value coming out of the PLL, which is a part of the inverter control software, which synchronizes the inverter to the network. And as you can see, for example, this always has to be at 50 Hertz, what is the network frequency and following a contingency event like a voltage dip. Uh, typically here, as you can see, this is, this is clear that roughly 7.2 seconds, you see some kind of a resynchronization process, which is becoming more challenging under low SCR conditions. Uh, this always can be tuned to some extent, but typically when talking about very low SCR, this tuning is more kind of a balancing to what may be under very specific conditions is giving you the best, best results. But what 
actually is quite obvious here, as you can see, if, if those synchronization processes take up to, I don't know, two, three, or even 400 milliseconds, it is quite quite understandable that during this time, the inverter cannot ramp up its output power to the pre-event value, which is, for example, following automatic access standards of the NER, required to be done within 100 milliseconds. So the main takeaway here would be that when SCR is very, very low, uh, definitely one has to consider that maybe the most optimal performance or the most dynamic performance of the generator is typically not achievable. And for the later interconnection studies or wide area studies that are performed, it is actually quite likely that there is some kind of interaction maybe with other generators or other network equipment in general quite likely to happen and simply needs to be considered from, from a generator connection process. So for the project developer, it is important to understand that the lower the SCR, the higher the risk that there will be some kind of delays or even additional expenses if, if some kind of, of countermeasures, which may be installation of additional equipment could be, need to be taken. So when talking about low SCR, it is important to understand that all inverters which are running as asynchronous generators require a minimum SCR for stable operation. So we as a manufacturer, for example, give a certain number to which SCR we guarantee stable operation of the inverter. But here one needs to understand that SCR at the inverter is different to the SCR at the point of interconnection. So when talking about SCR, a clear definition on which SCR we're talking about simply needs to be given. Um, as, as long as we are talking about projects which are here in this in this green zone, what would be an SCR DPOI of above three? Um, I would expect a pretty much straightforward connection process, which allows standalone tuning of the of the generator to achieve maximum performance, which is simply possible. Uh, when going lower with the SCR, so that would be the yellow range here, going down, I don't know, from three maybe to roughly 1.6. This is the range where most of the Australian projects are. Uh, there were actually good changes that some kind of interaction with other network equipment is possible, but definitely not easily predictable during the, the generator design process. Uh, to really work this out, detailed wide area EMT studies are required, which then can highlight what kind of interaction or additional effects, whatever it might be, have to be considered and then can be addressed via the generator tuning process. When going even lower in this in this wet zone, what would be with an STR of below 1.6? Um, there definitely asynchronous generators are not are not the preferred the preferred technology in general anymore. Uh, and and alternative operation modes of the inverters like quit forming would be needed. So when we are in this wet zone, we are not we are not talking about low SCR limitations for synchronization, for example. And there, when using quit forming inverters which generate their own reference, we need to consider other additional limitations, like, for example, the transmission capability of the network itself. Um, Based for all the discussions we're having here is, is definitely that there is a, a very relevant need for high quality simulation models of all the equipment which is used are going to be connected to the network. So to allow the, the network to be studied and operated stably, it's simply a must have that the high quality simulation models of any relevant equipment is there, is provided, is up to date and, and can be used. And maybe to give an idea from the SMA experience, what SCRs we see on international, uh, internationally, so projects in Europe typically see an SCR of six and, and up to 20, 30 or even higher, depending on, on where they're going to be connected. Utility scale projects in the US typically are in a range between SCR of two and maybe eight or nine. So some low SCR discussions are taking place there as well. In Australia, that's one of the number one topics I would say. So here we are definitely pushing the limits and, and projects in this red zone, at least under contingency events, are definitely quite common. Uh, and that's what makes the, the whole market here so challenging, but also interesting and, and allows a lot of, of learning.
And to wrap up what I just shown you, maybe those are some recommendations I would like to give. Uh, so based on, on the SMA experience, I think it would be a good idea with regard to the regulatory framework to, to consider some kind of a differentiation, maybe what STR level generators uh, are going to be connected to. And maybe if the STR is quite low, whatever a good value may be, maybe below two or something, uh, it would be a good idea to maybe not try to tune the system to achieve automatic access because this kind of aggressive tuning does not really support the network under those low SCR conditions and it could even destabilize the network. Furthermore, some additional flexibility, I would say, is quite helpful um, because for future, or in general in the future, I would expect that, that there will be a lot of additional learning that we're all going to do. And, and all those stuff typically finds its way in, in, in additional firmwares of, of existing equipment, which could be updated to deliver better security. And this could be with regard to, to the system performance, but also to stuff like IT security, what is becoming more and more important. Uh, but currently, generators are actually not too happy to update their equipment because they have to go through this change process which typically is, is quite intense and needs some time and effort to do so. So making this somehow easier to consider always the latest technology is definitely an important aspect that should be considered. And, and last but not least, uh, this topic of standardization maybe could be helpful here so that OEMs like SMA, for example, uh, get the information about procedures for testing and benchmarking of new technologies so that maybe we can even perform more offline testing of our equipment, but then at the end of the day, maybe a base to make the connection process easier and maybe even faster, what then again could be beneficial, for example, the flexibility of updating existing systems. Yeah, that's it for my side. So thanks a lot for, for listening. Um, and I'm looking forward to the questions following in the following Q&A session. Thank you.